Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the August webinar on Common Compliance Pitfalls of Surplus Lines. My name is Julie Mendel, and I'm the Education Trustee for the SILA Foundation. And before introducing today's speakers, I have a couple of housekeeping items for everyone. This webinar is one hour in length, and it is being recorded. Please put your questions into the chat box and that we will monitor and pose. We're going to pose all the questions to the presenters at the end of the presentation. If we do run out of time and you still have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. We will respond to those via email within the next week. And then also within the next week, you'll receive a link to the recording and a post webinar survey that we would appreciate you completing. Today, we have two speakers. Lorenzo Houston is the Assistant Manager for Surplus Lines at Resource Pro Compliance. His expertise includes 14 years leading his team to help brokers nationwide manage their surplus lines tax filing needs. And also with us this afternoon, we have Elaine Nance, who has helped agents and agencies nationwide manage their licensing and compliance needs during her 11 years with Resource Pro Compliance. As a member of the marketing team, she writes extensively on licensing, corporate, and surplus lines compliance, insurance industry trends, cybersecurity and data privacy, and operational design and agency management. Today, they will be sharing a dozen common pitfalls of surplus lines. So please join me in welcoming Lorenzo and Elaine to our virtual stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it, shall we? So the first topic we're going to cover is filing in the wrong state. Um, but uh, did you want to go over the objectives first? Um, no, we can go ahead. Just go ahead and get started. Okay. All right. So before we start, before we jump into this, it's important that I preface this by providing a little history about how we got here, okay? So in July of 2011, the Non-Admitted and Reinsurance Reform Act, also known as the NRRA, was passed as part of the Dodd-Frank Act. This law specified that only the home state of the insured is allowed to collect taxes or impose their laws on a surplus line policy. Before this, if you had risk in 10 different states, guess what? There was 10 different filings that you had to file on that one policy. So it's safe to say that all those surplus lines is still very complex. It is much, much, much simpler than it was in the past. So our first issue that occurs when a broker files a surplus line policy in the wrong state, it could be as a result of super hum of simple human error or you know, the more common reasons is a misinterpretation of how to determine the home state rule. So there's a few different ways that you can determine the home state of a policy. Um, the first way is if the insured is an individual, it's pretty straightforward. The home state is where the individual maintains their principal residence. If the insured is a business entity, it can get a little bit more complicated. If the policy covers just one entity, then the home state is where the entity maintains its principal place of business. If the insured is a group of entities, meaning more than one entity is being covered underneath the policy, then the homes, you use the home state for the entity that has the largest percentage of premium attributed to it. Now, there's one more wrinkle to consider if that wasn't enough already. If none of the in, insured risk is any home state, then disregard all of the rules above. Instead, the home state is wherever the greatest percentage of taxable premium is allocated. So what are the consequences of filing the policy in the wrong state? Well, I mean, there's going to definitely be extra work if you file a policy in the wrong state. First, premium tax rates and stamping fees vary between jurisdictions. So anybody involved in surplus lines knows that all of the rules vary depending on which state you are involved in. So things like broker fees, inspection fees, et cetera, that may be allowed in one state, but prohibited in another. Whether such fees are subject to premium tax, that also varies. So you'll likely need to redo all of your calculations. If you collected too much premium, or excuse me, too much taxes, you'll have to return that to the insured. If you didn't collect enough, you have to go back and collect that or eat it yourself. Also, filing the policy in the wrong state means you haven't filed in the correct state. If the filing deadline in that state has passed, you may be subject to late fees and other penalties. Lastly, while you can submit a refund request for premium taxes or other fees paid to the wrong states, 
regulators can be slow to issue refunds. The, the speed at which you get your refund is going to vary depending on which state you're dealing with, how fast their processing times is it, amongst a bunch of different things. All right. Our next problem that can come up is choosing the wrong carrier. Uh, when you have a surplus lines policy filing, you must identify all the character carriers that are underwriting that risk. And usually this is a straightforward task, but if you do have a complex layered policy, it can be perfectly easy to overlook one of the participating insurers. Uh, most states maintain a list of eligible non-admitted carriers on their state website. And it's not uncommon to find that there are several large carriers maybe who have subsidiaries that are listed, or you may even have two unrelated companies with very similar names. So the name that you use on the policy filing form has to exactly match the one that appears on the policy document. Uh, finally, it's also very common for carriers to move on and off of a state's eligible carriers list. This can be at the carrier's request. It doesn't mean that there's anything you know, wrong or that it reflects badly on that insurer, but it does mean that each time you get ready to file, you do need to check that most current list before either binding or renewing a policy. Amending an insurer or using the wrong name can delay the processing of that filing until that deficiency uh, is resolved. You may hear that referred to as a tag in some states, and it can, of course, even result in the rejection of a filing. And then again, you know, if you have to find, you know, if a carrier is no longer eligible, eligible in that state, you may need to find a new approved car carrier. And all of that can just delay that filing process, which can then result in late filing penalties. Another very common issue is miscalculating the premium. While this error might involve simple mathematical errors, issues with miscalculating premium amounts more often results from the broker or compliance coordinator misunderstanding how the state defines premium. Some jurisdictions may allow brokers to assess policy fees, broker or agency fees, inspection fees, et cetera. Others may cap the amount of these assessments. Sometimes this is a specific dollar amount, while other regulators simply state that fees must be reasonable. So it's very, very important to understand the rules governing policy fees, et cetera, for the states that you plan on writing business in. Finally, filers must understand whether a fee is subject to premium tax in a particular jurisdiction. For example, if the states that allow policy fees only in the states that allow policy fees, only 87% of those tax the fees, only 66% of jurisdictions tax broker fees. If the rules concerning the assessment and taxation of fees aren't applied properly, brokers can end up overpaying or over underpaying the premium tax. Overpayment can result in a lengthy wait for a refund to process, as we kind of mentioned earlier, while underpaying can incur financial penalties. So it is very important that you make sure you understand the rules about around any state that you're getting ready to write business in. The next thing is one that really speaks to me since I started my career in licensing, and that is transacting business without a license. Uh, if you are soliciting, negotiating, selling, contracting, or receiving commissions from Surplus Lines business without an appropriate license, uh, that can provoke very serious regulatory responses. Uh, but of course, sometimes you know having the wrong license could be something as simple as transposing digits in a license number or mistakenly using one broker's license for another, you know, human error things. In this case, it's usually just all it's required is an amended filing in order to resolve that issue. But you do need to remember that brokers cannot do business if their license application is still pending at the state. You need to wait until that license issues and they receive their license number before they begin transacting business. Um, also, if a license happens to go inactive, say for a failure to renew, they should not conduct business while that license has that inactive status. Uh, lastly, each individual or entity that negotiates or sells surplus lines needs to have their own license. Uh, you cannot submit policies that were generated by one individual under another person's license. The best way to avoid 
the issue with this is to verify that the broker has an active license before they conduct any insurance business and to be very proactive about license renewals. It's also a great idea to go back and confirm that that license is still active before you file a policy information or a surplus lines tax report with regulators. And again, we're seeing you know, the consequences of failing to do this, you know, very similar to the others we talked about, processing delays, rejections, uh, and of course, that can also cause regulatory fees, fines, and you know, other actions that can prevent you from working in the non-emitted market in the future. All right, choosing the wrong coverage code. This is a very easy one to, easy mistake to make. Um, so while any broker can have mistakes, they can make mistakes and select the wrong coverage code when they file a policy. There are some bad habits that can result in choosing the wrong coverage type or code when filing the policy. That can result in processing lays and rejections, otherwise known as tags, if you file online for any of the, you know, file for any of the online states. First, many states break down their coverage descriptions very specifically. Using a shortened version of the coverage name or choosing the wrong specific code can create problems. Second, the insurance product included under certain coverage types can vary amongst the jurisdictions. So in other words, um, you can have a general liability policy that you know, is very specific on the type of coverage that it's providing in one state, but it falls underneath just basic general liability in another state. It is very important to understand how each rule, or excuse me, how each state um, specifies e or classifies each coverage. So you make sure you choose the right code whenever you're filing your policy. Second, the insurance product, uh, uh, be sure to select the proper coverage type for the state where the policy is being reported so that your policy isn't rejected and it doesn't cause delays. In states like New York, they're going to review your deck page um, whenever you submit the policy for filing. They're going to look at the coverage type that you selected and they're going to verify that you did select the wrong one, excuse me, the right one. If you did select the wrong coverage code, they're going to reject the policy and you have a certain amount of time to correct it before you get issued a late fee. Um, lastly, some states use alpha, alpha numeric codes instead of, um, or in addition to the text names, these can also vary amongst jurisdictions. So just like anything and you know, kind of see uh, this trend in surplus lines, all states kind of operate a little bit differently, but it is just important to make sure you understand how the state that you're writing in treats the coverage that you're, that you're writing. All right. The next common problem we have is missing or inaccurate documentation. Uh, many states will require that brokers submit a copy of the declaration page or some other type of policy document along with policy information or the tax form report. Uh, failing to do so can result in processing delays or even the rejection of a report or filing. Uh, now the information that you provide must fully agree with what appears in the policy documents. Additionally, regulators will not accept documents that have been altered in any way. Uh, this could be you know, whiting out some information, striking through lines, or even adding handwritten notes. Uh, the reason for this, of course, is they want to make sure that the policy document they received is the one that the insured reviewed and signed. No subsequent changes have been made. Uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, they do allow brokers to temporarily use a binder to document coverage. However, they expect that filers will go back and replace that binder with the declaration page once it is available. And in New York, this is actually treated as an endorsement. Uh, finally, many states, especially those that track declinations by admitted carriers, as part of that diligent effort process, uh, they have specific forms that they use to capture that information. Failing to provide it or using an outdated or incorrect form can also result in those same tags and other processing delays. And this is a very, very common, and it may seem pretty obvious to some, especially those that have been doing surplus lines for quite some time, but failure to file, whether it's a filing or report, that is a very common um, error that you see in surplus lines. Um, you know, a lot of times what happens is a broker will get involved in surplus lines, um, not out of, not 
in on purpose, but because they can't find the coverage in the admitted market. So they, they're not familiar with all the laws and regulations that govern surplus lines. Failure to report a surplus lines insurance policy or submit the appropriate premium tax report is a common error. It is very, very common, especially in states where broker must wait and file policies on a periodic tax report. Transactions can be overlooked in the rush to compile the report and supporting documents. In many cases, if you file a report and then you go back and realize that there was policies that were missing from that were placed during that time period, a state will need to, you'll need to submit um, an admitted report for that specific state. Some states treat reports as you're, you're reporting the policies that were filed during that specific time period and not necessarily when the policy was effective. So again, one of those things where you kind of need to understand exactly how that state governs the policies. Often brokers misunderstand when filing um, when filings and reports are required. Examples of this include not realizing that some states require tax reports during the year in addition to the annual report, not realizing that tax reports must be completed for tax exempt insureds. To be clear, tax exempt doesn't necessarily ap always apply to surplus lines. And just because something, something is exempt from surplus line taxes doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to file the policy or submit any kind of supporting documents. Not filing zero reports were required is a very common mistake. Just because you did not write any business or place any policies during that specific period, many states require that you submit some type of report explaining that there was no business placed during that period. Not filing stamping fee reports, which these are separate from tax reports. Just because you've paid your taxes does not necessarily mean that you are compliant. In many states where there are stamping offices, they assess a stamping fee on top of the uh, original um, surplus line taxes from that policy. Penalties for failing to file policy information in premium tax slash zero reports range for late filing fees to having your license completely suspended on the individual or the agency side. Additionally, many states require late filers to use the tax rate and forms that were authorized for use at the time of the transaction that was um, filed. This not only creates additional work to identify the appropriate rates and form, it also increases the risk for filing and reporting errors by processor who are used to using the current processes. So just because you're making a correction now, if you're, if you're making a correction to a policy that was effective um, when our previous tax rate was effective. You need to make sure that you understand if the state applies that tax rate retroactively or is, if it's for anything effective from that point going forward. Uh, the next one we have is that risk can be inappropriately placed in the ENS market. Um, many states require brokers to attempt to place a risk in the admitted market before they turn to the surplus lines market. Uh, that's usually referred to as the diligent search requirement. Uh, the exact number of declinations that may be required does vary from state to state. We find that three is very typical of that, but you will want to verify what your particular state is looking for. Uh, brokers may also need to uh, supply details to regulators about these declinations declinations that may be part of the filing place and reporting I mean, process, or you may just be required to retain proof of those declinations in the event there is a complaint or just a random audit. Uh, brokers also need to make sure that they are showing in good faith when they are obtaining these declinations. Uh, they need to be writing, uh, the insurer needs to be willing to write a similar type and class of insurance um, as the play broker wants to place. And then you also have to make sure that you are requiring or getting the required declinations for each piece of business. Uh, you can't reuse past declinations, even if it's for very similar risks. And those declinations also need to be obtained within a reasonable time frame of putting that coverage in the admitted market. Uh, some states do count it as a declination if you request uh, to a carrier for coverage and they don't respond within a given period. And additionally, a lot of states have, or most states, have export lists. These are coverages that are exempt from the diligent search requirement. 
Uh, finally, of course, there are some types of coverage that by law can ne not be placed in the not admitted market. So you will need to be aware of those as well. Um, if state regulators discover any kind of problem with the declination information provided, they're very likely to tag that or outright reject the filing a report. Uh, it's important to realize that this decision does not stop that compliance clock. So brokers who need to submit a corrected filing or report can face late fees if they allow too much time to pass between the time they submit some, a filing with the wrong information and then submit the corrected filing. And this goes into our next topic, which is omission of the state stamp. So um, for stamps, play, they do play an important role in ensuring policyholders understand that basically their policy is being placed in the surplus line market and not the admitted market. In particular, they remind insurers that the solvency of surplus line carrier is not guaranteed by the state's guarantee fund. Stamps are illegal notices and generally must include very specific language. They may also reference sections of state laws or insurance regulations. These stamps are going to vary depending on which state you use, just like everything else that we've um, spoke about in surplus lines. Many states specify mini minimum font size for the state stamp and they require it to be printed in a boldface type. A few want the notice to appear in contrasting color, for example, red, where the rest of the policy may be printed in black. Others require that a box or border surround the notice. This box is to ensure that the state that the stamp stands out and doesn't blend in with the rest of the policy. Many states require that the broker placing the coverage in a non-admitted market must be clearly identified. This usually means providing the name of the broker, their initials, and in many cases, their signature. A few states also require the broker's surplus line license number or additional contact information. The goal of this is to make sure that the insurer knows exactly who they need to contact for questions concerning the policy. Um, failure to include the state stamp will require may result in processing fines, delays, or penalties. And um, I also want to throw out that in uh, states like New York, uh, they where they physically stamp the policy themselves, once you submit the policy and it's been accepted by New York, they'll stamp it and you're, also, you're supposed to return that policy to the insured, um, but you have to wait for the policy to get stamped before you supply it to the insured. Okay. <clears throat> the next common problem is incorrect premium tax rates or stamping fees. Uh, while the states don't change their premium tax rates or fees very often, uh, it can actually make it easier sometimes for to overlook when they do occur. Uh, you should always make sure that you are verifying the rates and fees each time you file. Uh, at the beginning of the year, it's particularly important. A lot of states do make their changes then. But if it's been a while since you filed a policy in a particular state, you'll want to go back and double check that that information is still up to date. Uh, additionally, jurisdictions may require brokers who are making late filings or who are making endorsements to use the tax rate and stamping fee that was in use at the time for a late policy, either when it should have been filed or for an endorsement when that policy originally took effect. Uh, and then one thing I want to mention about retaliatory rates. In 2023, Maine decided that they were going to assess a retaliatory premium tax rate for policies that were underwritten by insurers who were domiciled in states with a higher tax. Uh, they have subsequently reversed this decision, which was something that a lot of people in the industry were very glad to hear about. But it is possible that another jurisdiction may pass a similar rule at some point in the future. So it's certainly something you want to sort of keep aware of now that that is out there. Um, if you are using the wrong rates, it's the same as miscalculating the premium amount. Uh, you can wind up overpaying or underpaying uh, premium taxes or stamping fees. And again, as we said before, overpayment can result in a lengthy wait for a refund and underpayment can incur financial penalties for failing to pay the entire tax amount in a timely manner. All right, so unaddressed deficiencies. This is a topic that, this is a very, very common issue. Um, you know, a lot of, in a lot of cases, once you submit something, you assume that you're, you, you know, you're in line, you're, you've met the regulations or the laws that of that specific state, but that's not necessarily the case. In many jurisdictions, the errors 
um, that we've mentioned before may be caught by state stamping offices. They may not be caught by state stamping offices. Um, and if they are, the online portals for filings and reports will typically show these notices as tags. Often the surplus line licensee or contact person listed on the online account will receive an email alert. Sometimes the specific state that you're filing in will allow it to be, you know, um, whoever is handling the filing for that specific policy. Sometimes that state will specify that the licensee has to be the contact. Tag notices describe, generally describe the nature of the problem and may offer suggestions for clearing the tag. Usually filers can see tag transactions within 24 to 48 hours. You know, again, this is one thing that kind of depends on how backed up a state is. Um, we've seen tag notices be instant. We've seen cases where a state was so backed up that they didn't even get a chance to review a policy for 30 to 60 days. In some states, however, regulators acknowledge receipt of a filing report almost immediately, but may not review the document until much later. In states with online portals, an authorized user can log into the account, locate the tag, filing a report, make the required changes, and resubmit the form. There should be a rapid confirmation of the submission, and often the tag will show as resolved. Otherwise, email or mail the corrected documents to the regulators. You know, again, this is going to be state dependent. It's going to depending on the state's rules. In some cases, you can address the tag via email. In some cases, you resubmit the the missing policy information directly online. It is it is very important to resolve your tag promptly. Tag notices often give files just a specific time frame in order to correct the, the error. 30 days is a very common one. After that period elapses, the filing of report is released to the state insurance department as is with the tag clearly noted. And for everybody out there who writes business, if you are being referred to the Department of Insurance, make sure it's for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. Depending on the nature of the tag, the commissioner may reject the filing or report and possibly impose fines or other regulatory actions. Additionally, submitting an inaccurate or incomplete filing or tax report doesn't stop the compliance clock. So you can submit a filing to a state the day that you write it. If the state says that you have to submit that policy within 30 days of the effective date, if you do not clear that tag within 30 days and it's the 31st day and you and you clear that tag, technically that filing was late, even though you submitted it a day after it was effective. So it is very important that you get in there and you make sure that you correct those tags as soon as you see them. Delays in addressing tags, even in states where regulators may not provide notices of delinquency, of, excuse me, of deficiency quickly can take filers past the compliance deadlines. Then you may have to face to beat the clock or you're going to end up facing penalties for that late filing. And then the last one we're looking at is just overlooking deadlines during mergers and acquisitions. We all know that we in the insurance industry love our m and activity, but if whether you're the buyer or the seller, if you've been through m and process, you know that it can become all-consuming. Yeah, everyone is focused on preparing for the sale or negotiating the transaction. Completing due diligence, of course, is just, you know, usually a very demanding process for your entire team. And then you've got to go through the integration process. In the midst of all of that, it can be so easy to lose track of individual surplus lines policies or compliance deadlines. Uh, one solution for that is to delegate responsibility for tracking those deadlines and submitting the appropriate reports and filings. That can take one thing off of the to-do list for your agency and broker and just make sure that during that time of change, you're not you know, incurring any regulatory penalties. Uh, it can also prevent, of course, past due filings. And then the other thing that can really be an advantage there is when you are having a change of responsibility, you'll need to decide very clearly who is going to be responsible for compliance filings before a certain date and who is going to be responsible for those filings afterwards. And sometimes having a third party help you with that can make passing that baton a little easier. Yeah, it, that's a very good point, um, Elaine. And I also want to add to that, um, doing, during the due diligence in M&A, a lot of times what happens if for anybody who is familiar with are involved in the M&A process, 
you know, you'll during due diligence, you review the financials, you review the contracts that may be in place with specific carriers and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of times the surplus lines just gets completely overlooked. So, you know, it may or may not be a deal breaker that the entity that you're looking to acquire has reports that haven't been done in three years. It may or may not be a deal breaker that, you know, you're taking on an agency that has a $50,000 outstanding penalty that that's, that that's looming. But, you know, those are the type of things that you're going to want to know up front so you know exactly what you're getting into. So, you know, for anybody involved in the M&A process, make sure that you are reviewing um, the surplus lines compliance side of it as well. So the next topic that we're going to cover is we're just going to provide some tips. All right. I mean, there's we covered a lot of different things. We covered a lot of different issues and common mistakes that occur. So now we're going to provide some tips that will help you stay compliant and avoid some of these. So we've discussed steps that brokers can take to avoid specific situations, specific uh, pitfalls, but let's end with the four essentials, do's and don'ts. Be proactive. It is much, much harder and much more expensive to catch up on surplus line filings and tax reports than to keep up with them. Give yourself and your surplus line licensee some lead time before a deadline. Otherwise, you're going to be racing against the clock and you're more likely to incur fines and penalties. Then you can double check that all policies and supporting documents are in order. And before you start writing in a state, be sure you are aware of how that state governs surplus line policies. I have seen too many times where a hundred, a thousand, however many policies have been written and they're all written wrong because this the broker didn't understand that a state requires this information on a deck page, a state requires these fees to be broken out this way. It is much more time uh, time effective if you know that information up front so you don't have to go back behind and issue corrections. Keep a calendar. There are many, many deadlines for surplus lines compliance, license renewals, policy information filings, premium tax reports, et cetera. A good calendar is a compliance coordinator's best friend. These tools are very, very important. It can be anything from a paper desk calendar or an Excel spreadsheet or a sophisticated pro, uh, project management tool. For an example, Kentucky, um, for anybody who writes in Kentucky understands, there's multiple different types of reports that have to be completed. So, you know, there's, it's important to keep up with all the different things that are due, um, whether it's on paper or, you know, some type of tool. Can create a culture of compliance. Having a compliance coordinator can be invaluable for an ENS brokerage of any size. Of any size, excuse me. Nothing makes a coordinator's job more difficult than having to chase down agents and brokers for information. Leadership must hold every team accountable in their part of the process. Licensees need to understand that they are responsible for meeting filings and reported deadlines. It does not matter if you have passed that information off to somebody who works for you or whatever the case is. Ultimately, that responsibility lies on you. After all, any penalties for noncompliance attached to their license and harm their regular harm your regulatory reputation. You know, it is very essential, um, especially being that in a lot of ways, compliance is kind of looked at as one of those back office things, you know, it doesn't necessarily make money for the company, but it can cost the company a lot of money if you're getting hit with penalties for not um, submitting your filings or reports on time. Build relationships with regulators. Regulators are not the enemy. Okay, they are not. They may seem scary when they're calling you requesting information, but they are not your enemy. They're not looking to smack you around for every honest mistake that you make. They want to succeed and they're off they're often offer you a wide range of resources. Many of them will do it for free. And lastly, don't get complacent. The non-admitted market is constantly evolving, it's constantly changes changing. Coverages move on and off of export lists. Carriers enter and leave states. Regulations and rates change. Saying, but we've always done this way or this is how we do it in our home state doesn't appease regulators. Know exactly what you're dealing with in that specific state and make sure that you are compliant. All right. And at this point, uh, let's go to Julie and see what questions we have. 
Okay, uh, so the first one isn't a, a question. It was just a, a, a statement to kind of back up some of what you've said, but Washington State currently has 122 admin actions pending due to not filing a zero report. Mm -hmm. So just kind of reinforce some of the things that you said. Um, and the other question that I have is, uh, do you have or is there a resource for carriers to advise which states require surplus lines policy and transaction reporting and when those reports are due? Um, you know, if we have something like that in our SILA, um, quick links or not. Lorenzo, you want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, there are a few different resources out there. Um, you know, we do have a tool that kind of um, has all that information. Um, Lock, Lock, somebody mentioned Lock Lord in the chat. That is another great resource. Um, you know, there are different tools and ways that you can manage that information. Um, you know, it just really kind of depends on what specific state you're looking for and if you're looking for, you know, all 50 states at once. Having a tool that brings all that information together in one place really just can be an invaluable time saver. Oh, absolutely. Um, it looks like can agencies can agencies to their license? Looks like there's a word missing. Is the question, can agencies use their licenses for other agencies? That, that's, that seems to be the logical uh, word. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it depends on in, in what um, reference you're, in, in what relation, what the relationship is. If you're referring to unaffiliated agencies, um, unless you're looking at retail and wholesale arrangements, um, you know, it's really going to depend there. Most states do not allow what's called courtesy filing anymore. There are a few states, there are a handful of states that do allow it, but it really kind of depends on which agent, which state you're looking at. Lorenzo, it might, be help well, excuse me. It might be helpful to explain that there are states that sometimes where it's policies are filed exclusively under the individual's license or under the agency's or brokerage's license. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, in 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 many cases, just like again, anything surplus lines, this the way or how you handle that is going to differ. There's going to be some states that allow you to file an either license, meaning if you want to place the policy on a on a an individual's license, you may. If you want to place it on an entity's license, you may. And then there's some states that say you can only file it underneath an agency's license. And there are a handful of states. Um, that say that you only can file it underneath an individual's license. So, you know, it really kind of depends on which state you're dealing with and how they look at who is responsible for that surplus lines policy. And understanding, go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. so, and understanding that is also very important when it comes to dealing with zero reports as well. Absolutely. Okay, we have another another comment. Um, Connecticut, Connecticut is currently reviewing due diligence information. Penalty for failure to provide declination details starts at ten thousand per policy. They are being reasonable about providing additional context and are great to work with. And that was put in as an FYI. Uh, we have another person who agreed that the lock board resource was a good one, but also suggested that sometimes a, a, a Google search can provide you with the information that you're looking for on surplus lines. And then some states have you report for both or all of them. I think that was in response to your, your previous discussion here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's very important. And I'm, I'm very glad that Jeff, thank you, Jeff, by the way, I'm very glad that Jeff mentioned the um, Washington, the Washington um, pending um, admin actions, because it, it can be a very, very cost effective, uh, cost costly mistake to not have file those zero reports. I mean, you're already not making commission on those licenses or in that specific state. And now you have these fees that you're incurring on a license that you're already not making money on. So, I mean, it is definitely imperative that you stay on top of that type of stuff. Okay, I don't see 
any additional questions. Um, so unless you guys have some last minute thoughts, I, we can go ahead and. Oh. Uh, one thing I'll add last minute, again, referring to zero reports, it's important to understand that that kind of compliance obligation, if it is a zero report state, begins the moment that license is issued. So a lot of times people will go ahead and get their license in anticipation of business. Just realize you may be racking up compliance obligations from the moment you get that license issued. Yes, um, very good point, Elaine. And Brittany also mentioned a very brought up a very um, good point in the chat as well. Um, it is crucial to make sure that someone, when someone leaves your agency, you have a surplus lines agreement in place. Um, that is very, very important. They can always say they believe that you were going to maintain those licenses or the obligation for maintaining those licenses fell underneath the agency. Um, so yeah, it is definitely important to make sure you have some type of agreement in place. I'd also like to mention that, you know, when, if a license cancels or you let a license, you cancel a license or you let a license, you know, lapse or whatever the case is, that does not mean that you are no longer, el you no longer have to meet the requirements of that specific state in which you held a license. In many states, you still have to do a report for that period in which the license canceled or became inactive. So um, I have seen situations where a license was canceled three days within, um, three days with, into a quarter, and they did not file a quarterly report and was penalized for that. So you definitely want to make sure that, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, you know, if a license was effective any time during that period, it doesn't matter if it was January. If you're if the license was active, make sure you file a report, um, whether it's the following year, the following quarter, whatever the case is. Okay, we're getting a, getting a few more comments. See, I said we wrap up early. It wasn't quite, it was premature. Uh, we got some more information from Washington in the chat. Uh, Washington's looking into the possibility of eliminating the zero filing requirement going forward. And that comment is getting some love there as well. So um, let's let's hope that that goes forward. Um, and then WSIA also has some great resources on surplus lines regulations and taxation of fees, also carrier eligibility requirements. Um, oh, more from Washington for the, for the industry that may, for the industry that may not be aware, Model 870 Non-Admitted Insurance Act has been revised and adopted by the NAIC. You may want to go to the NAIC website and take a look at what states may be revising for the surplus lines laws in, in upcoming legislative sessions. That's really great heads up. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. And Okay, we've got more. One more here. Oh, not one more. <laughs> um, Let's see, correct, always make sure to see when when licenses were issued or canceled because that they will come after you. And if for some reason there is a problem or a mess up, I find being honest and open with the state is the best policy. You may get a slap on the hand, but it won't be detrimental to the company. Uh, more love for Jeff going out there from the, from the audience. And then if a license for an agency is lapsed, but the producers are licensed, is the filing requirement on agency or producer? Um, I, I guess it kind of depends on which state you're referring to. I mean, if the, it could be both, um, depending on um, which state that you're referring to. I mean, if a, if a license, if a, it's a state where the policies have to be filed on the agency's license anyway, but you're still required to file on the individuals as well. You know, it, it really just kind of depends um, which state that you're referring to. If anybody has specific questions like that, uh, in the slide deck, we do have contact information for Lorenzo and for me. You know, please feel free to reach out to us after this webinar and we'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, there's another 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 one. They, they keep rolling in. Does anyone recall if a particular state recently changed their filing time frame? 30, 60, 90 days. 
recently? Um, not that I remember, Kay. Um, not to, yeah, um, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't recall that happening um, recently. Okay, I'm not seeing any, it's a little bit of a side conversation, but no more, no more questions from the group. So with that, um, if you do have questions, you can email them to uh, Silo Foundation. If you scroll back to the very first comment in the chat, it gives the email address there. Lorenzo and Elaine, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise on a very complex topic. We appreciate both of you and your time this afternoon. I would ask everyone to please uh, please watch for the notice for the September webinar, which will be our second annual fireside chat with the current NASA president. And remember that our webinars are open to the public. They are free of charge, and we appreciate you sharing our invitations. Please look for and complete the post-webinar survey, and we will see you next month. All right. Bye, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending.